Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today we're doing one of my favorite formats, a hardware show and tell shop floor style. No sponsors, no marching orders, no oozing sincerity for the highest bidder. Just gear that I actually begged, bought, borrowed, or stole, put on the bench, and formed opinions about after living with it for a bit. We've got four categories on the menu today. First, a mini PC that promises desktop class horsepower, modern AI acceleration, and enough I.O. to impersonate a docking station. Then there's a 40-inch ultra-wide monitor that costs just a fraction of Dell's Halo 5K 2K panel. We'll see what you give up and, crucially, what you still get. After that, two keyboards that don't just click, they sense, using magnets and math, so I'll explain why they feel different from the mechanicals that you're used to and what that buys you. And finally, the Ringer, NVIDIA's Thor module, a robot brain on a board that we conscripted for three very unrobotic tasks. My software drag racing prime benchmark on the CPU, reinforcement learning training in CUDA, and running big local models in Olama when they can fit into 128 gigabytes of RAM. So let's pull back the covers. I'll start with the mini PC because it's that box that surprised me the most. The Geekom A9 Max looks like the traditional NUC class cube, but it's built around AMD's Ryzen AI9 HX370. The Zen 5 mobile part with the new XDNA2 NPU and a Radeon 890M integrated GPU. Translation, compute cores for real work, an iGPU that can actually play well at 1080p, and an on-die neural engine that's no longer just a checkbox item. Geekcom markets it as the most powerful AI mini PC under $1,000, and the spec sheet is the right kind of noisy. Wi-Fi 7, Bluetooth 5.4, dual 2.5 gig Ethernet, USB 4 on both cheeks, and support for up to 128 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 and 8 terabytes of PCIe 4.0 NVMe across two bays. It'll drive four displays and tops out at 8K if you really want to count pixels the extravagant way. It ships with Windows 11 Pro and even includes a Kensington lock slot so that your teenagers have to work a little harder to borrow it. Now, the AI bit matters because the AMD XDNA2 NPU is finally pushing usable performance for on-device tasks like noise reduction, background separation, super resolution, and the photo tools we are all starting to use. Now, the combined platform AI number that AMD touts for this class, which adds the CPU, GPU, and MPU, lands in around 80 tops, which is why you're seeing vendors pitch these as AI mini PCs instead of just fast ones. In practice, that meant Photoshop's neural filters felt snappier on integrated graphics, and the Copilot class doodads ran without pegging all of the CPU cores. TechWriter's review reached the same general conclusion. Strong 1080p creative performance and rapid multitasking with 4K video and heavier games still the iGPU's natural boundary. That matches what I saw. Where the A9 Max really earns the shop stamp is the connectivity and acoustics. Two USB 4 ports meant that I could hang a 40 gig dock off one side and a portable NVMe slot off the other without turning it into a stuttering mess. The dual 2.5 gig ports make it a tidy little PF Sense or NAS brain if you want to swap roles on the weekend. And the cooling solution, which is big copper dual heat pipes and a sensibly tuned blower fan, stayed in the I can hear it if I get close, but not if I stay away, even if I abused it with handbrake. Geekcom claims a 52% bump versus the usual mini PC thermal setups. Now, I can't verify that percentage, but I can confirm that it never throttled in my transcoding run and didn't cook itself into a little latte warmer. For a thousand bucks less than usually less if you watch around, this is the small box that I'd pick for light editing, lab infrastructure, or for the everything PC that goes behind a monitor arm. Speaking of monitors, let's address the 30 pound gorilla. 30 pound gorilla? Yeah, it's about that. Dell's UltraSharp 40 curved 5K 2K. It's the dream ultra wide for a lot of creators because it stitches together productivity math that just works. 5120 by 2160 across 40 inches, a 2500R curve, a Thunderbolt 4 hub with enough downstream ports to clean up your desk, and Dell's IPS black panel tech that deepens contrast without giving up IPS color and the response that you buy these for. This year's U4025QW even does 120 Hz over DisplayPort or HDMI with VRR while keeping that 5K by 2K pixel grid. It's the big kid on the playground, and the price tag reminds you of it if you ever hover over the Add to Cart button. But what if you don't need a Michelin star, you just need a very competent burger and fries at like half the price? Well, enter iNockins, and I don't know how you pronounce their name, it's I N N O C N. They're 40C1R, a 40 inch 21 by 9 ultra wide that's playing an entirely different game. It's still 5K 2K resolution, though I ran the scaling to keep it at an effective 4K because I'm old. It's an IPS panel with a brightness of 350 candles per square meter. The maximum refresh rate is 100 Hz. 
and the stand has tilt, swivel, and height. It does pip and so on for split screen work, and the input array is its greatest hits album. One display port, two HDMI, a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, two USB-A and a USB-C that can be your one path cable from your laptop to the big glass. I wouldn't confuse it with a calibrated reference display, but for editing YouTube bound video or software development, gaming and day to day work, it really earns its keep. So now I'm on the desk of our editor earning its way. So what do you give up relative to the Dell? Well, display brightness, quality and the KVM hub. Dell's 5K 2K is simply crisper, especially for coding and text all day, and its Thunderbolt hub and high watt power delivery make it a do everything desk anchor for a modern laptop. The Anakin is more of a straight shot panel. Plenty of performance, decent HDR-ish, highlights, and a refresh rate that casual gamers can actually use. If you're the sort of person who notices font rendering quirks on site, the Dell will coddle you and charge accordingly. So if you want a big canvas that's smooth, colorful, and good enough color-wise to grade for the web, the Anakin 40C1R is the kind of sensible pick that keeps the budget committee from meeting in your kitchen with you. Now, keyboards. I've typed on more switches than a telephone lineman, and I still love a well-tuned mechanical keyboard. And I've used some terrible keyboards. In fact, I wrote an actual book before there was AI to write it for you, and that meant a lot of typing. And I wrote that book on one of the worst keyboards this side of the original PET, the infamous MacBook Butterfly keyboard. I'm a heavy typer, not the guy you want to share an office with. And that meant two things. First, I wore the letters completely off a few of the keycaps, something I've never seen happen before. And I developed like lumps on my cuticle, something else I've never seen before, and thankfully, they went away when I quit using that keyboard. Full disclosure, at my desk here I daily drive just an old RGB Corsair K70 with blue mechanical switches, so I'm not a connoisseur, but I'm certainly getting pickier. But I've been around long enough to recognize a real change when I feel it, and Hall Effect boards are that change. We brought in two, the Keychron K10 HE, a full-size workhorse, and the K6 HE, a 65% compact that does the same party tricks with less real estate and a little rosewood trim if you want to peacock a little bit. Both use magnetic sensors instead of physical contacts to detect a key press. Picture a tiny magnet traveling within the stem and a sensor in the PCB. As you press, the magnetic strength field changes and the firmware decides when that's pressed. It's not binary the way a contact leaf is, it's analog. And that means the keyboard can know how far a key has traveled, not just whether it made or broke contact, and that unlocks behaviors that a traditional switch simply can't do. So let's translate that to feel. On a normal mechanical switch, the actuation point is a physical thing, where the metal contacts meet, and the reset point is too. You also get switch balance, which your firmware has to debalance with time, and that's part of why the rapid taps sometimes feel a hair sticky, especially in games where you're feathering movement keys. But with a Hall Effect setup, actuation is a threshold in software. On both the K10HE and the K6HE, you can set the actuation anywhere from 0.2mm to 3.8mm, with 0.1mm of precision along the way. You want hair trigger WASD at 0.3mm, but a deep, deliberate spacebar? You can assign that. Because the board is reading analog signals, rapid trigger becomes table stakes. The instant you begin to move back up, the key can reset, no need to pass a fixed mechanical reset point. So you get less hysteresis, faster repeats, and a level of control that feels like you've tightened the steering in a car that you've driven for years and didn't know that it had that nut on the steering box in order to tighten it. Don't do it. Within Keychron's launcher, you'll also find more gamer-adjacent features, like last key priority for strafing logic, multi-action dynamic keystrokes, and onboard 1000Hz polling over both wired and 2.4GHz so the software tricks aren't undercut by a sluggish or latency link. The K10HE even spells it out plainly in the specs. None of that negates the joys of a great mechanical tactile, of course, but you can also tune the Hall Effect board to feel normal if you miss that friction. But what these give you is a new axis of control without the fragility of physical contacts. In a coding session, I like a slightly deeper actuation on modifier so that I don't fat finger control or alt or caps lock. But in a Twitch game, I go shallow on movement, keeping the space middling for jumps, and I push R and E deeper so that I don't reload when I cough by mistake. If you've never used rapid trigger on a platformer, prepare to land on exactly the pixel you meant to. For the record, both boards here are hot swappable, but only with a double rail magnetic family of switches because the magnet and the stem geometry have to match the sensor's expectations. And both keep Keychron's normal strengths, Mac PC toggles, via QMK style programmability, and acoustics that lean towards thock instead of ping. That sound is thanks to stacked foams and a solid plate design. 
The Bluetooth leg is still 125 hertz, as you'd expect, so game on 2.4 gigahertz, or wired, if latency matters a lot to you. If you're deciding between the two, get the K10HE if you live on a number pad, spreadsheets, DAWs, or just the comfort of the full 100% layout. The K6HE is what I throw in a bag with the laptop. It gives up the navigation cluster, but keeps the arrow keys and feels every bit as premium as the full desktop. Keychron's special edition trim adds wooden side rails and PBT in the taller OSA profile, which I like for long writing sessions. Either way, the argument isn't really mechanical versus magnetic, it's fixed physics versus programmable feel, and that's a fun argument to have. All right, time to talk about the one with the Marvel name. NVIDIA Thor isn't a consumer graphics card. It's a family of edge compute modules meant to be the brains and robots and advanced self-driving vehicles. We got hands-on with the Jetson Thor platform and its developer kit. Blackwell class GPU, an ARM Neoverse V3 series CPU complex, and importantly for our purposes, up to 120 gigabytes of memory on the module. The module's rated AI throughput is wild for its power envelope. On the order of two petaflops in the 4-bit domain that NVIDIA uses for generative inference, and yet it sips somewhere between 40 and 130 watts depending on the configuration. Think workstation-ish performance in a paperback book size. We didn't bolt it to a humanoid or a robot, we put it to work on three shop jobs to see how it handles the non-robotics chores. First, my software drag racing prime number benchmark. That's a pure CPU contest, no GPU shortcuts, so it's a good way to take the temperature of the ARM complex on a board like this. I compiled the code native for ARM, pinned the threads, and let it eat. Clock speed isn't everything, and the Neoverse cores don't chase the silly high single-core desktop boosts of desktop x86, but the thing held its own. On a per watt basis, it's frankly excellent, and if you scale thread sensibly, you can keep all the cylinders lit without thermal drama. Now, I wouldn't trade it for a high clock desktop, but uh, I no longer think of embedded as synonymous with slow. Thor made that point loud and clear. NVIDIA positions Thor for autonomous vehicles as well. Drive AGX Thor is the sister platform, and the shared DNA is the hint. These are cores designed to be predictable and fast in a sustained way, not to just sprint to 6 GHz and then fall over. Second, my Tempest Reinforcement Learning AI, the CUDA-based stack that I've been tinkering with to teach an agent to master the chaotic problem of controlling Tempest, that's a GPU story, and the Blackwell-class GPU and CUDA toolchain felt, well, familiar in the best sense. I just recompiled our kernels, made the usual concessions to an ARM host, and ran it headless. Though throughput was strong, and time to average beat our older Ampere-era workstation by a comfortable margin at a fraction of the wall power. CUDA is CUDA. If you stay on a paved road, you cash the benefit of a decade of tooling. If you venture off it, you'll still wind up SSHing into SIS once or twice, but that's half the fun. And third, the one a lot of you asked about, Olama. Local LLMs are a perfect fit for a board with this much GPU memory. The caveat is simple. Your model has to fit, and then some. With 128 gigs on tap, we could run surprisingly beefy 7 billion and 13 billion models in comfortable 4-bit quantizations with long context, and if you keep your eye on the tokenizer choices and the KV cache growth, you can nudge even into larger territory. The ARM64 story for Olama has matured a lot. Once the container's happy and the drivers are squared away, it's just a matter of choosing your quant and not getting greedy. There's a temptation to pretend Thor is a drop-in replacement for a big desktop GPU, but it's not. But for the class of models that fit, the experience is smooth enough that I kept forgetting I wasn't on a rack mount somewhere in the garage. So if your use case is chat, code assistance, and rag against your own corpus of documents, a 128 gigabyte edge box makes a persuasive argument for keeping things on premises. Let me zoom the lens out a bit and put the four items in perspective, because a hardware roundup is only as useful as the patterns it reveals. The first pattern is AI features by osmosis. A year ago, an NPU and a laptop or a mini PC mostly meant you had the right sticker. Today, with Ryzen AI 300 series silicon, you have tools that are already actually tapping into that engine. It's not a panacea, you still want CPU grunt and GPU bandwidth, but it's the first time that I've actually used a mini box where the phrase AI PC felt like more than just a press release item. The AI 9 Max embodies that trend as a practical workstation that happens to accelerate AI chores you'd otherwise ignore because they were too slow. The second pattern is big glass without big guilt. Dell's U4025QW is the one I would buy if money is no object. It's the crispest, least compromised 40-inch ultra-wide that I've ever seen on this bench, and Thunderbolt makes a two-cable desk into one. But in the real world, where cost may be a factor for you, the Inokin 40C1R was good enough that I stopped noticing it was the budget option and just enjoyed having an enormous, fast canvas. If your workflow leans more towards video, timeline scrubbing, code, gaming, and so on, then you'll probably actually like this monitor a fair bit. You might miss the hub one day and forget about it on day three. And third, 
keyboard feel is graduating from which switch do you use to what curve do you program? For the longest time, your choices were brand, spring, weight, stem shape, and lube. Now you can decide how far you want a key to move before it counts and whether the reset is immediate or staged. That's a generational change. If you're skeptical, try one of these key crons for a week and set WASD to shallow actuation and space and control deeper, and then go back to your favorite tactile board. Nothing will be wrong with the old board, you'll just miss the fine grain control the way you miss cruise control after a long highway stretch. Also, for the practical among us, the K10HE's 1000 Hz over both wired and 2.4 GHz means the fancy sensing isn't being bottlenecked by a lazy link. So it's hard to go back. And finally, the future is loud, small, and strangely polite. Thor exists because the world wants smart machines to react in real time, far away from the data center. That we can steal one for a week and use it like a tiny power-sipping workstation is a happy accident of that revolution. A module that NVIDIA intends to guide a robot dog around a warehouse turns out to be happy simulating an agent, churning through primes, or answering your questions off a local model. If your lab or shop or house or whatever has a reason to keep computing at the edge for privacy, latency, or just the satisfaction of hearing the fans spin when the work is going on, this is the first time that an embedded dev kit felt like it belonged on the same shelf as your workstation. Now, a few closing practical notes from living with this gear. With the A9 Max, use both memory slots, not just one giant SO DIMM, because you want dual channel for the 890M's sake. If you lean into the four monitor life, budget some time for cable labels. Once you've got HDMI 2.1 and two USB 4 links in the mix, it's all too easy to play musical chairs with the wrong ends of the same cable. On the monitors, the Anakin's factory calibration report was accurate enough for my eyes on YouTube bound work, but if color matters, spend a half hour with a probe. Now, if you're a font snob and you spent eight hours a day in the terminal, you'll probably prefer Dell's 5K 2K sharpness, no question. But you already knew that. For the keyboards, remember that Bluetooth is still the slow lane. It's fine for writing, but not for eSports. So use the 2.4 GHz or the wired option for the 1000 Hz polling. And don't be afraid to set silly shallow actuation on just a few keys to try it. Per key settings are the point. I like 0.4 mm on WASD, 1.2 mm on space, and 1.0 mm on shift. Your hands will tell you when you've gone too far. You'll start fat fingering it. Dial it back a tenth and never think about it again. In theory. And with Thor, embrace containers. Because whether you're doing RL experiments, running Olama, or spinning up services on the side, Docker makes swapping in new builds trivial and gives you a nice clean way to pin driver toolkit versions in an environment where the GPU stack is, let's say, moving very quickly. The developer kit's power ceiling means it can live on a shelf without tripping the breaker when everything else in the shop comes online. Just don't expect it to be a 4090. It's an entirely different race entirely, and it wins the one that it entered. Now, if I had to hand out the garage awards for this episode, here's how I do it. Best all around goes to the Geekcom A9 Max because it turned into whatever I needed that day. A little editor, a download box, a four display email bulldozer, and it never fussed. The value pick is the Anakin 40C1R because it's big, bright, 100 hertz at this price. It's pretty kind of ridiculous that you can get that these days. The keyboards are the once you try it prize. I'll keep a Hall Effect board on the bench from now on because fine tuning actuation is one of those upgrades that you don't know you want until you've tried it. And the innovation ribbon goes to the Thor for making edge compute feel like a little workstation that snuck into the lab in a hoodie that nobody noticed. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, and this video is completely unsponsored, so I would appreciate it if you could leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please check to confirm that that's still the case. And if you've got a question or opinion, please voice it in the video comment, and remember that we go through them and go do the best ones each week on Shop Talk on the Dave's Attic channel. We're really trying to build that channel as well, so please check out an episode, and if you enjoy it, consider subscribing there as well. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.